All right, it's Easter morning. How are we doing, community of faith? Yeah. Good. You know, God is writing a great love story. It's not finished yet. He wants you to be a part of it. In fact, he wants to write you in to his love story if you're not a part of it yet. And it's a really simple thing, the way that we do it. It's not just some silent thing inside of our mind. God said, I want you to do a specific act to begin to step into this journey with me, and that's baptism. We're going to baptize at the end of the service. And what's amazing, you're here, you know we're going to baptize at the end of the service, but maybe you didn't know that you were getting baptized at the end of the service. For some of you, we want to make that available to you because God's going to call you out in this service and say, this is the time, this is the decisive time moment. I've been talking to people out in the lobby after the services with tears in their eyes and said, this was the time that I stepped into all that Jesus wanted me to do. Because that's, that's how we step into the, to the love story. I know, you know, baptism doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes to our modern mind because it's like dip underwater. If God had asked us to climb Mount Everest, we would have done it, right? If he was at the top of Mount Everest, but dip underwater, I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that, but it's part of the story. See, he's writing this amazing story. And we'll talk more about baptism at the end, but I want you to get ready to be baptized. We got everything for you. Some of you were baptized as kids, but in the New Testament, people were always baptized as they stepped into this journey with Jesus. It's a really cool thing, baptized as a kid, your parents, the priests, the pastor saying, I want to raise this child up, loving God, loving his church, but it's time to take it full circle. It's time to to step in for yourself today. You know, we're going to look at a passage that uh, really shows a side of Jesus that a lot of us haven't seen and haven't thought about. When people tell me, you know, I don't know about Jesus. I don't know about Christianity. I don't know about this stuff. I always say, have you read the words of Jesus? Because so many of us, we're just kind of going by second head knowledge, kind of like the American religion, right? But if you read the words of Jesus in the book of John, that's what I always say. Look at his life, look at his words. And that's what we're gonna do today. We're talking about a resurrection, but it's the resurrection of Jesus that we're celebrating. But I want us to look at another resurrection too. We'll look at both. The resurrection of Lazarus, one of the most famous stories in, in all of the Bible. But in it, we're gonna see that Jesus had some really intense, strong emotions. In fact, it says that he was deeply moved in most of our English translations. He was deeply moved and that he wept. So we see him sad and weeping, but we also deeply moved in the original language of the Greek and the, the version we're gonna use, the New Living Translation today gets it. it. It means to be angry from deep inside. Did you know Jesus was angry? In fact, they used it sometimes, this word to the, the to, signify the snorting of a wild stallion that was angry or a wild bull that was upset. What's Jesus so upset about? What we're going to see is he's upset about the way that we have to live, the things that we've done to ourselves, the human condition. Most people I talk to, they have this feeling like we were made to last forever, and yet we all die. Jesus is saying in this passage, that was not God's intent. That was not what he wanted. That was not the story he wanted to write. But way back in the book of Genesis, it tells us, God said to us, I give you dominion over this planet. I give you the rule and the reign over this planet. And God meant it when he said that. And our very first forefathers, our ancestors fell on their face, rebelled against God, sinned not long ago. After that, murder came into play, and we've just seen this snowball of stuff. If it hadn't been them, them, it would have been us, because all of us have sinned. And so we see this thing in our life, but when Jesus is looking at death, he said, that's not the way it was meant to be, and he gets angry about it. He wants to do something about it. And the thing is, he does do something about it. That's the, that's the cool thing that we're going we're gonna to see. So... I'm glad you're here because, you know, some of these big questions we have to ask ourselves if we're going to even live normal everyday life with purpose and meaning, like why are human beings even here? What is this all about? 
What is wrong with the world? I haven't talked to anybody lately that hadn't felt like there's something really wrong with the world, and, and, and there is. It's not the way that God intended it to be. As we look at this passage, we're going to see that the big question, what can set us right, is answered better by who can set us right. We're looking at John chapter 11, and in this, we're going to see that Jesus friend Lazarus. He was really close to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, two sisters and a brother. In fact, he would probably go there in his quiet times when he could get away from the crowd. They were like family to him. Well, Lazarus is really sick. Jesus is off preaching, and they send word to him, hurry, get back here. Lazarus is really, really sick, and Jesus doesn't stop preaching for four more days, and Lazarus has died, and when he gets there, he, he's, he's died, and, and we're going to see what Jesus does when he comes in contact with this. It's nearing the end of Jesus' life. In fact, the decisions that he makes here, you're going to see that affects the next week as he's led off to die. It's a decisive moment. I think this morning is going to be a decisive moment for you too. So let's dig into this. We're going to see a Jesus maybe you haven't seen before, but I want you to see the real Jesus. I want you to <clears throat> to know who he really is. That is the first thing we want you to see today is who Jesus is, what this passage says about Jesus. Listen to the story. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. It's interesting because Jesus is talking to Martha here, and she misunderstands exactly what he's saying to her. In that verse 24, she said, I know that he'll rise again on that last day when everybody else rises from the dead. The Jews of that day believed what was written in Daniel chapter 12, that there would be a resurrection on the final day. And so Martha held that belief as well. She kind of gave Jesus that religious response, the, the Sunday school answer, if you will. She wasn't thinking about what was happening in this moment, but she was looking out to the future, and Jesus is calling her to say, I'm here right now. I am the resurrection, and I want to impact your life today. She knows it in her head but it hasn't really filtered down into her heart. And I wonder if that describes any of us here today. Maybe you know something about Jesus. Maybe you've been taught about Jesus. But do you really know Jesus personally? Pastor and author Edwin Lutzer puts it this way, we do not need a savior who can just help us. We need a savior who can resurrect us. We don't just need a savior who helps us when life gets tough. We need a savior who can help us when life ends. And I love how Jesus interjects himself here in the, in the middle of Martha's misapplied theology, and he tells her in verse 25 exactly who he is. It says again, I am the resurrection and the life. Literally in the Greek that, that says, I, even I, and only I and the resurrection and the life. He's defining who he is as the Christ. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me, he shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus is trying to, to move Martha from thinking about something in the far off future to realizing this is happening in the present tense moment, that Jesus is here, that he can raise people from the dead. You know, he says, I am, not I was or I will be, right? He's talking in the present tense. Jesus didn't merely say that there is a resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection. He's defining himself. It's not an event, but a person. We see all through scripture, 
God defined in this way. He says, I am love. I am peace. And here he says, I am the resurrection. He's telling us who he is. And then Jesus drives it home into Martha's life and into ours. He starts by saying, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Whoever refers to all people, everybody in the world, whoever believes in me. And then he narrows it down a little bit. He says, if you believe in me and you live in me, you will never die. And then he takes it down and focuses on Martha. And I imagine he takes her face in his hands and he says, Martha, do you believe this? He makes it very personal to her. And I love Martha's answer. She says, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. And she's not just nodding her head in agreement and saying yes, but Martha's making a really bold confession of her personal faith in who Jesus said he is on that day. Theologian N.T. Wright puts it this way, resurrection isn't just a doctrine, it isn't just a future fact, it's a person. And he's here, and he's standing in front of Martha. And he's here today as well, and he's standing in front of you and me. And I imagine him holding your face in his hands and he's saying, do you believe this? Do you know me? personally. Jesus is wanting to hear you say, yes, Lord, I believe. This is the day, and this is the time you can make the same bold confession that Martha made of her faith in Jesus today. So Jesus tells them who he is, but he also, I want you to see how he loves. It's amazing the way that that Jesus loves. Let's go on in the story with verse 28. Then Martha returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Now Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she's going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him, he asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. Martha comes to Jesus first, and she says the same exact thing that Mary is going to say later. They're two sisters. They've probably been talking about it they're probably wondering, why, was Jesus, why did he not show up when they expected him to? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus, though, gives two strikingly different answers to the two sisters. To Martha first, he claims and proclaims his deity. He says, I am the resurrection. He didn't say, I came to give resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. And John, in another place, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am life. No one comes to God except through me. His claims to deity are all through the Gospel of John. In almost every chapter, we see different things. We see him saying things like, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Before the world was ever made, the fall of the evil one from heaven as an angel, he was there, he saw it, and everybody going, how could you have seen seen that, but he's claiming to be God. Then, what I love, Mary comes and she just falls at his feet and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And she's just bawling her eyes out. Jesus, he's practically speechless. He enters in that moment to her heartache, the way she feels. And he looks around, he sees everyone else wailing. A deep anger wells up within him. It wasn't supposed to be this way. It's not supposed to be like this. This is a mess. This is not what God intended. This is what we as mankind have done to ourselves. And basically all he can get out is, where is he? Show me where you laid him. Tim Keller says, We would never imagine that such a divine person would get sucked into Mary's agony and just stand there weeping. Why would he be so strong one minute 
and so vulnerable the next. I mean, if you made up the story and it was about a divine being come to earth who could raise the dead and he knows he's getting ready to raise Lazarus up in just about 10 or 15 minutes. I mean, would he be crying? No, he'd be going like, ha ha, this is gonna be so great. Everybody's crying, but I'm gonna show them who I am. This is gonna be amazing. This is gonna turn everything around. Just wait, right? But Jesus, he stops. He feels it. He sees what it's like when we lose someone. It, it's so amazing that the divine God would step into our world and feel with us. Ken Geyer, he says, for a beautifully tender moment in this passage, we're, we're given the privilege to glimpse one of the most provocative embraces between deity and humanity in all of scriptures. Thank you, Jesus, for giving dignity to our grief, freedom to our emotions. Angry at God today? Angry at what's happening in the world? Angry at something that's gone on in your life? Don't understand? That's okay. He says, it's okay. Emotions are good things. Thank you, Jesus, for the beautiful tribute that tears are to the dead, telling them they were loved and will be missed. Thank you, Jesus, that you know how I feel. See, Jesus was fully God and also fully man. He wasn't 20% God and 80% man or vice versa. He wasn't just a being that understood some things about deity. He wasn't just a deity that kind of understood some things about being human. He was fully both. He was the God man and he gets us. In fact, the Bible says, when you pray, don't imagine that you're coming to someone to pray that doesn't get it, that doesn't understand, that doesn't care, that's apathetic because Jesus understands everything you're feeling. Last night, when you're crying in the middle of the night, you couldn't sleep, Jesus was there and he was crying too. He was with you. Might have felt like he's a million miles away, but he's not. This is the Jesus that's the true God that we worship. He knows how we feel. It's totally the opposite of the way the, the Greeks thought of their gods. Their gods, they had one word that described them, apatheia in Greek, apatheia. We get our word apathy, we get our word apathetic from it because that's what their gods were. They were apathetic to the plight of mankind. In fact, you see all through their stories, they toyed with mankind. They, they just kind of played with us like playthings. They didn't care if we lived or died. Jesus is showing us that the true God is not like that. He has stepped into our experience. I also want you to see very clearly today what Jesus did on this day. I've read this story hundreds of times, but it wasn't until we were studying for this Easter that I really saw what happened that day. Listen in verse 17. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. It was common belief among the Jewish people at that time that on the third day after somebody was buried, that the spirits would come back and they would hang around the tomb to make sure that the body was actually dead. And when the body began to decompose, then the spirits would leave knowing that the body was dead. Jesus knew that the people believed this. Obviously, that's not something found in Scripture, but it was a commonly held belief. And so he waited. If he had come back on day two and brought Lazarus back to life, people might have said, well, he wasn't really resurrected. He wasn't really dead, right? So he waited until day four, and he came when he knew everyone knew and believed that Lazarus was already dead. And listen to what happened. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Just like Mark said earlier, the Bible says that Jesus was angry as he arrived at the tomb. That anger welled up within him 
what was he angry about? He was raging against death, just like we do. He didn't say, you know, everybody dies, it's just part of life on the planet. He was angry that this is the way it was. It was not how God intended for life to be for us. He's mad at the evil and suffering in the world, and he's crying and angry. The Bible says, and I think we all know it deep down in our hearts, that so much of what goes on in the world today, the suffering that we experience, it comes from our own human hearts, right? The selfishness, the pride, the cruelty, oppression, war, and violence. They're deep in our hearts, this selfishness that we have, and we experience that. But Jesus, he didn't come to bring judgment that day. He came to bear judgment. And as we see this story unfold, it's in this moment, on this day, that Jesus makes that final decision that he will be going to the cross on our behalf. Jesus knew if he brought Lazarus back to life this day, that the religious leaders were going to be incensed, that they would be seeking to destroy him. And that's, in fact, what happened. You see it in verse 53. After Lazarus has been raised from the dead, it says, so from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Jesus knew this. He knew if he brought Lazarus back, if he rose, raised Lazarus from the dead and brought him out of the tomb, that he would be uh, making certain his trip to the cross and his trip to the grave. He knew that if he stopped Lazarus' funeral, that he would be putting his funeral into motion. And that's exactly what happened. And knowing all of this, Jesus still said, Lazarus, come out. He did it for you, and he did it for me. He knew it was going to cost him everything to save us from death. And the people saw him there with tears on his cheeks, and they said, oh, look how he loves Lazarus. But it was really for love of all of us that he raised Lazarus from the grave. He became human. He became mortal vulnerable, killable on that day. And he knew it, and he chose it for you and for me. I was reading this week earlier author Tammy Perlmutter's Reflection on Easter, and she called it the good catastrophe. I want to share with you a couple of her uh, thoughts because they stuck with me this week. This is the story of Jesus after he was crucified in Matthew 27. Listen to this. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb, and went away. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary, sitting opposite the grave. The two Marys, they loved Jesus. They had given everything to follow him and to serve him. And they've just watched him crucified, and they've just watched him be buried in a borrowed grave by their friend Joseph. And the Bible says here they were sitting opposite the tomb, but I really imagine that it wasn't quite that calm of a thing. I imagine that they were wrecked with grief. that They were sobbing, holding one another up, because everything they hoped for, everything they dreamed of, had just died. Jesus had been crucified. He was buried. He was dead and gone. And their hope was buried right along with them. Have you ever found yourself sitting outside the tomb, feeling betrayed, feeling that your hope has died? Have you ever found your life crashing down around you thinking this is it, this is the end, and almost kind of wishing that it was? Have you ever been paralyzed with grief, consumed with despair, no room in your heart for hope, asking, God, where are you? What are you doing? I know you said, that everything would work out for good, but this, this is too much. Collapsed and crumpled outside the tomb, all of us, I think, have felt that ache of emptiness and loneliness that forces us to say, God, why are you not here? Where are you? For some of us, it's long years of abuse and living every day with the damage that's been done. For some of us, it's an addiction, deep and shaming, and we think we'll never be free. Maybe it was the death of a friend, a parent, a loved one, the loss of a job, failure. Maybe marriage is on the brink, infidelity, separation, divorce. Maybe you have a child living in your home, but it feels like they're a million miles away. 
parenting a special needs child, silently struggling with your sexuality or gender identity, the ravages of chronic illness, the suffocating shadow of depression. None of us expect to find ourselves sitting outside the tomb. We don't imagine that that will be our story. But the tomb has to be here because it's at the tomb that we finally, reluctantly reveal our brokenness. It's at the tomb that we find repentance. It's at the tomb that healing happens. The tomb is a gift that gives our hearts, that leaves our hearts so desolate that the only the resurrection can heal them. If you were here for Friday night service, I imagine you felt that sense of desolation as Jesus was nailed to the cross and died that day. But without the tomb, none of us would have been healed onto the shore rescued. The tomb is part of the story. It's a necessary part of the story. It completes the story. Without the tomb, there would be no place or reason for resurrection. The tomb is the heart of the gospel story. It's the father who didn't want his children to think that they'd been abandoned and left. It's the father who didn't want his children to think they weren't worth dying for, that they weren't worth defeating death for. And we now have the amazing opportunity of living in the shadow of the cross. You've heard that phrase before, right? Living in the aftermath of the tomb and the reality of resurrection. Living in grace that's permanent and unchanging that's personal and eternal. It's a story we've been written into, like Mark said earlier. Even though we experience loneliness and despair in all of our stories, he's overcome the world for us and he will make our joy complete. Grace wins every time. Sunday always comes. Jesus himself is the good that comes from the catastrophe. Well, why does it matter? Dorothy Sayers, was a contemporary of C.S. Lewis. She was one of the first women to be admitted to Oxford University. She was a tall, kind of gangly woman, not very attractive, but a huge intellect. And she wrote detective stories. Her most famous stories were the Lord Peter Wimsley detective stories, read all over England at that time. And Lord Peter, in her stories, he was an aristocratic detective. He was amazing, kind of like Sherlock Holmes. He, could, he would solve these crimes, and it was so amazing, but he was also very lonely. He was alone. About three books into the series, he meets a woman by the name of Harriet Vane. Harriet is a tall, not very attractive woman. She was the first woman to ever be admitted into Oxford University, She wrote detective stories, and they fall in love, and they marry, and they begin to solve crimes together throughout the rest of them. And his whole life changes because Harriet is in it. What's going on there? People have speculated down through the years that Dorothy Sayers looked into the world that she had created, and she she, she looked at her creation, Lord Peter, She saw his pain, she saw his loneliness. She fell in love with him. So she wrote herself into the story to save him. You know what? Easter reminds us that God did the same. He saw the world that he had made, he saw his creation, he saw us struggling, trying to extricate ourselves from the death, the pain, the misery we had brought on ourselves through our rebellion and our sin against him, and he wrote himself into the story to save us. And the Easter resurrection, the real life resurrection, the thing that actually truly happened all those many years ago, tells us that the story isn't over, it's still being written. At the end of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, the hobbit Sam, who thought that they had lost everything. They thought that everything had gone wrong. He was like knocked unconscious and he was out for a period of time. And, and when he wakes up, he sees that the sun is out. He sees Gandalf, the, uh, the great wizard. And Sam says this, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad 
going to become untrue? I think Tolkien was reflecting some spiritual realities in this. The answer of Jesus is yes. Do you know that what Jesus is saying when he says, I am the resurrection? He's not just giving us a consolation. I come to bring resurrection. He's saying, I come to make all this evil, all this bad, I'm going to make it come untrue. Death will become untrue. That injustice that you're holding against God, that abuse that you suffered as a child will become untrue. Jesus will take all of these horrible things, everything bad that's ever happened, and he will rewrite it. The author of the universe is going to rewrite the book that we have totally messed up. John, who wrote this account, he says, this is what happens at the end of time. God gave him a vision, a glimpse, maybe even brought him there in a physical way. We don't know for sure. But he sees at the end of time, and he sees one on the throne, and he says this in Revelation 21, right at the end of the Bible. He says, the prophecies are fulfilled. Jesus will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning, no more. Crying, no more. Pain, no more. For the first things have gone away. And the one who sat on the throne, Jesus, announced to his creation, us, see I am making all things new. He didn't say some things. He didn't say a few things. I'm going to rewrite it. He goes on to say, it is done. Does that remind you of the cross? It is finished. He says, I am the alpha and the omega. I'm the A and the Z. I put all of this story together. I'm the beginning. I'm the end. And I will see to it that the thirsty drink freely, from the fountain of the water of life. And then, you know what he does? I just can sense that he's here right now, and he takes your face in his hands, just like he took Martha's so long ago, and he says, as he calls your name, do you believe this? It changes everything. But it's not just a little verbal assent in our minds. He says, I want you to step into the story that, that, that's what baptism is. We don't get it in our modern mind, but baptism is telling a story. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in a brand new life, the death resurrection uh, of Jesus, sins washed away, everything made new. And then there are going to come a day for all of us when he rewrites our story. I can't even imagine that. I don't, he's going to have all of eternity to do it. He rewrites it. I want you just to pray with me. I want you to sense this one that is fully God and fully man. And if you could see him before you as he's looking into your face and he's tilting your chin up toward him and he's got tears in his eyes because he sees what you've been through. He knows what you're suffering with. As he says, do you believe this? And I'm going to ask you to take a simple step. Step out. If you've never done it, and be baptized. Father, I just ask that you would give us that insight. We're here. We're suffering from so many hurts. Some of us have been so mad at you for so long because we haven't understood where you've been. What's going on? Your ways are so much higher than our ways. We haven't understood that you gave us as mankind dominion and we're the ones that brought the sin, wreaked havoc upon ourselves. But God, many of us right now in this place, we desire to make a decisive move for you, a move that changes everything, a move that begins to bring that resurrection life to bear in our life so that we can see when it's all said and done that you are the great author who rewrites the whole story. We say, come kingdom of God upon us. Be done will of God in us. Let nothing stop what you want to do in us in these next few minutes in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to pitch it over to Wes. He's in the baptismal. 
Thank you, Mark, Laura, for the words that you shared today. I think maybe after the truth that Jesus walked out of the tomb, my favorite thing about Easter is celebrating baptisms. And uh, today I have a new friend of mine, Jennifer. Just met Jennifer this week and uh, just heard a little bit about her story. And I wanted her to be able to celebrate baptism with you all today, but also for you all to hear just a, a snippet of her story and a glimpse of her story. Uh, Jennifer told me this week that she kind of grew up in church. She had an awareness of God in church, and there was somewhat of a belief in him. And then uh, she became a young mom and then continued to just kind of go through life. And there were some choices and decisions that she looks back on. She's like, I probably would have done maybe that different. But um, then a few years ago, she started to sense it was time for something different. And here we are, Jennifer, standing in a baptism pool on Easter Sunday. And, and this is an incredible moment. This is a moment that um, all of these people, if you didn't know this yet, are going to lose their minds over here in just a second when you come up out of this water. But before we do that, tell us why did you decide to get baptized today on Easter? So I had to write it down because I'm not too good at this. But so a few years ago, I decided that something had to change. I had tried everything else, and I wanted to give church another try, and started showing, showing up every week at Community of Faith. Since then, I've continued to understand and experience God's work in my life. I personally understand the power of prayer and recognize the value of putting God first in my life. My faith is growing. And today, I want people to know that I am committing my life to Jesus and that I am a child of God. I want to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. You know, Mark and I and Laura can stand on a platform week after week and teach truth about Jesus, but to see people respond and to hear people share their response to Jesus, I think may be even more powerful for all the rest of us to hear. So Jennifer, I'm super proud of you. I'm excited about the journey ahead and your life trusting Jesus, and it's because of that that I get to baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jennifer, don't look now, or you can if you want to, but this is, this is family. This is your family. This is our family. We're family. And I just wonder before we leave today, and I want to ask you to, to just stay seated for just a few more minutes because I believe that there's some powerful moments about to happen in this place. But I think that there's probably some here today that you didn't show up planning to get baptized. That wasn't in the Easter plans for you, and maybe you're already late to the Easter lunch. You just heard Jesus was four days late. So Jesus said it was okay. But we've been praying this week as a staff, and I believe the reason God asked us to pray specifically is because he knew there was going to be a group of people here today who were ready to take that step of trusting him and then celebrating that through baptism. So today is, is your day, and you're like, Wes, I didn't, I didn't show up prepared. I don't have extra clothes. Listen, surprise, we have everything you need. We got the T-shirts, the shorts, the undergarments, everything that a woman would need or that a man would need, the towels, basically every excuse that you might have really isn't an excuse. And I just wonder if there's some here today in just a moment, when I say the number three, they're gonna get up and you're gonna take this step because just like Jennifer, maybe there's been a belief in God, but it's been kind of distant. Or maybe there's been an understanding from childhood, but you've been living life in this pattern of life and today you heard something or you experienced something and it's like, I, today is the day I'm gonna lay my life down for Jesus. And we wanna celebrate that with you. Something that I was thinking about and I, I, didn't, I haven't said this all weekend, but in the last service, it just seemed like there was a significant number of dads 
that stepped into this pool with me and I got to baptize. And I say that because I just wonder if there's some dads here today and maybe God's kind of bothering you. He's calling you out. He's saying, I want you to lead your family, but I want you to trust me first. And I just wonder if maybe, I don't know. I don't know what God is doing in that, but I just felt like I needed to share it. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three in just a second. And on three, I want you to get up if today is the day that you're going to get baptized. And I want you to head right out those back tunnels. There's one on each side of kind of the tech booth. And our team, our volunteers are going to be out there. They're going to give you everything you need, show you where you can change. And then you're going to come meet me down by the pool or meet Birdie over at one of the other pools. And we're going to celebrate. But you're not the only one that's going to get up. You're going to get up with other people. You don't have to do this alone. There's a group of people that were already planning to get baptized. They're going to come down here and they're going to get up at the same time. Our volunteer team is going to get up at the same time, trying to make this most important step you could ever take easier for you to take with other people. So I hope you're ready. I'm going to say three and then the band's going to sing and then you're going to join me down here just a second. I hope you're ready. Here we go. One, two, three. If today's the day that you say, I trust Jesus and I need to take that step of baptism. Let's move. Let's move. I see people standing. Start heading to the back tunnels. Our team will tell you what to do from there. Church, we're going to celebrate in just a minute. There's no reason to wait and celebrate in a few minutes. Let's continue to celebrate now as the band sings.
we celebrate a risen king and we're not done yet. We're gonna, gonna continue to worship through song. We're gonna continue to worship as baptisms are happening on each side of the room. So we're gonna clap our hands. We're gonna celebrate as we see people moving from death to life, all because of what a risen king represents. Sing this. I was breathing, but 